morning. How's everyone today? A little early for Fetty Wap, right? So I'm Roberta Katz. I am a senior best interest attorney for the 19th Circuit. That's the um, Martin, St. Lucie, Indian River, Okeechobee. I am also not used to doing PowerPoints because I hate that you guys focus on them and not look at me, so I don't even know how to make this work. Hit slideshow. Hit slideshow. To the right. To the right. Up. Up. Right there. Oh, it says slideshow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm looking, I'm going, I don't know, what's she looking at? Oh, look, it's up there. I'm also the um, chair of the Human Trafficking Coalition for the Treasure Coast in Okeechobee which is why we're going to make this an advanced session. I did HT 101 last year. Doesn't mean you can't ask me questions, but just so you know, I did not include any of that from last year. So if you were expecting a repeat of last year, you were going to be sorely disappointed. Right? Nobody was expecting that. Right? OK. So I should have titled this, Do I Look Like a Victim? But when Kelly called me three months ago, I was being optimistic. And I titled this, Do You Look Like a Victim? So I renamed this, Do I Look Like a Victim? We are going to talk about, um, do you look like, do I look like a victim? Trauma, we're going to do some case studies. We have some questions. I love participation. I went to law school, so we use the Socratic method here. Do you know what that is? Some of you do. Those are the attorneys in the room. For those of you who don't, that means if you don't participate, I call on the person who looks like they're least paying attention in the classroom <laughs> to answer the question. That's what law school is. And we will be employing it here. If you don't laugh at my jokes, it kind of applies the same way. OK. So how many of you have teenagers on your caseload? Right? Everybody has a caseload. Everyone has teenagers on our caseload. How many of you have runaways on your caseload? How many, the ones of you who don't raise your hand, is that because you don't have teens? They're not runaways yet? OK. Potential to be runaways? Do any of you have potential to be runaway? I think they all have potential to be runaways. Um, and that's why I think it's important for you guys to know some of these signs. What about, do any of you have def um, children that have absolutely been identified as a human trafficking victim already? Okay. What about potential or alleged trafficking victim? They investigate, okay, so we're talking, this, this is, so good thing you're all here because you are my crowd to talk to. So, what's a victim look like? No, really, don't wait for the next slide. What's a victim look like? Do you know? Anybody. Anybody. Do any of your children, who took the social media session yesterday? Because I meant to go to that, but I didn't. So, who ha who, which one of your children has a social media website, web page? Facebook, Twitter, what else do they have? Instagram, I don't even know. I don't have teenagers, right? I have a 12-year-old who's not a teenager yet. He has nothing because I'm a helicopter parent from doing this job. So you can't, I always tell my guardians, I'm not the reasonable, prudent parent. Do not compare to me. But your teenagers all have a social media presence. presence. That's a great word. How do you know if they're posting something? How do you know if they're posting something that could mean, see, this is why I don't do that, because then you guys are watching. This is why I don't like fat PowerPoints. He's already reading the next slide that I didn't mean to hit. How do you know if they're posting a picture and there were some signs of human trafficking in that picture? Would you know? You will after today. That's like the best part of this session. I did put it first so you don't have to wait till the end. But while we're going through, you're going to think of these are what we're going to call tough questions. And these are going to come back around at the end. So I want you to be thinking of these. How do you engage youth that have been trafficked who don't want to engage? How do you get CSEC victims to understand exploitation when they don't think they're being exploited? CSEC. Remember, this isn't HT 101, but I will answer questions. Everybody know CSEC? No. Commercial sexual exploitation of children. OK? So those are your victims, commercial sexual exploitation of children. How do you get them to understand exploitation when they don't think they're being exploited? That's like asking a human trafficking victim, have you been trafficked? You know what they're going to say? No, I didn't hit any traffic today. I, I didn't drive, so I didn't hit any traffic. How do you deal with a youth you have been working with long term, you've been making positive progress, they understand the dynamics of exploitation, who then goes back to the life? You're hoping I answer that question, aren't you? Well, stay tuned. How do you work with a girl who has a daddy and says she's in love with him? That's one of my favorites. How do you deal with a youth actively recruiting other youths from your agency? Recruitment. I'm here to tell you, they're recruiting. 
They're recruiting in your agency, they're recruiting in schools. Whether they're foster children or community children, they're recruiting in schools, but that's my other soapbox. We won't go there. When recruiters and pimps know the location of your agency, what should you do? Yeah, you're hoping I answer that one. I'm not sure where to point this. Okay! So I had to create these own pictures. So I used myself. These filter things are amazeballs, amazing. Um, so anything there mean anything to you other than the pretty picture of me? It is very pretty, isn't it? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> anything, anything, a human trafficking sign on there? Queen. Why, do you know? He's probably told her she's a queen. Because I played the Fetty Wap, right? Which was trap queen and you were paying attention, Suzanne. Good job, All right, queen. This. Now, I told you I'm not the reasonable, prudent parent. So I go to a training. They tell us all the online signs we should be looking for. And I then went through every Facebook of every post of every one of my friends. And then I emailed them and said, do you know you're posting things that could be signs of human trafficking? And all my friends were like, I don't even know what you're talking about. So is one queen with a crown mean anything? Am I telling you to worry if your mother posted that she's a queen. <laughs> I'm not saying we don't have people trafficked at that age, but one, I'm just trying to give you a few, a few things. Does this mean anything to you? Locked down. Locked, who said it? Was it Suzanne? Gosh, you're good. Are you by me? Can you come work for us? Can you be on my coalition? My coalition needs you. Give me your card. Yeah, locked down. Loyalty locked down is a key with a lock. What about this? You know what that is? It is. More specifically, Gary, boss of mine. So whatever he says is right, just so you know. Snow Bunny means white girl for sale. All those Instagram and Snapchat with the bunny filters. So by the way, I go to make a filter on Facebook because I was like, I'm going to take the easy way out, right? I take a picture of myself. I go to make a filter. I can't find one bunny. There were cats. I couldn't even find dogs, which is interesting. We'll get to that. There were no bunnies. And I was like, huh, does somebody know that's a sign? I'm giving them a lot of credit. Anything here? I couldn't do all the pictures, so I had to use other people. The money. Money, dollar signs. A rose. Rabbit ears. Rabbit ears. I was hoping that's what you would think those are. What's this? 304. No, I mean, that's where I got it, but no. Apparently it's West Virginia, but 304 was ho on a pager. Yes. Yes. Oh, Maria knows. Remember the pagers, beepers? Ho was 304 upside down. See, all these signs you didn't know. Now, this is the one that got me. This is what I went and checked every post by every one of my friends on Facebook because they do that all the time. Everybody, yeah, you're shaking your head, right? You've seen it. Even in the comments section, they're posting that and then I'm looking, I'm scrolling up for my friends to see what else is going on, making sure there's no human trafficking going on on my Facebook page. She's got the crowd. What's the P? Pimp. P is for, nope, it's just a P on there. Could be. Could be, just a P means pimp though. We see those on pictures. She could be a pimp. We have female traffickers, we're aware of that, right? Female recruiters. Here you go, these are the most common ones. Daddy, the Rose, folks or family. Renegade, king and queen, M-O-B, M-O-E. Money over bitches, money over everything. I told you it was rated R, right? If you were here on time, I told you several times this was rated R. HGO, PGO, hoeing going on, pimping going on. See, my kid can get away with nothing, okay? <laughs> King and queen, the P, 16. P is the 16th letter of the alphabet. I mean, they're thinking, I'm telling you. It just blew my mind when I got it. B for bitch, for bottom bitch, trap. Anyone have a problem with the Fetty Wap I was playing when you guys walked in? 
Fetty Wap? Yes. I was playing a Fetty Wap video. He's a um, rapper. I was playing his Trap Queen song when some people, when everyone walked in, or some people. And it had the words about working the pole, and she's working for me, and bringing in 50, 60,000, and we're going to have matching Lambos. Who's listening to that music? Not you guys, apparently. So who is listening to it? Our kids. Our kids. Right? Your kids are listening to this. Well, we're glad, not we, they're being glamorized. Human trafficking is being glamorized through that, through commercialization, through child porn, right? Have you watched the way kids dress? I hate to be that parent. I have a boy. God forbid I had a girl. I don't know how I would have dealt with it. But have you watched them dress? Do you know they sell thongs in Macy's? In the tween section? Do you know what age the tween section is? 7 to 12? And I'm not asking anybody here to raise your hand if you're wearing a thong. It's not about you. But 7 to 12 year olds, it's available at Macy's. And what does it mean if it's available at Macy's? Somebody's buying it. Let's just talk supply and demand, right? Somebody's buying it. There are plenty of seats in the front row, and you could be my next example. <laughs> just kidding. So terms, daddy, folks, family, hoeing going on, pimping going on, renegade, stack, money over bitches, money over everything, pimp, king and queen, 100. What's the 100? Yeah. Just 100%. I don't know why they use that, but when you see those terms, and some of these terms don't have any other meaning like the rose, I was like, it's just a rose. Like, does it mean anything? But it's the combination of a couple of these. We need to ask a few follow-up questions. B, bottom. Trap, 304, I told you it was hoe on a pager. Rose, P is the 16th letter of the alphabet. Bunny ears or bunny, key and lock, loyalty locked up, a crown, doggy ears. What's the significance of doggy ears? What's a dog? Their bitch. Dog ears can also signify in a relationship. That's her pimp. Others know to leave her alone. She's not available. Snow Bunny, white girl for sale, trap queen. They recruit and groom It maybe the mom of the house. If you, say, if you see the words they're choosing up, they're choosing a new pimp, means they are available. Victims call it the life. Traffickers call it the game. I want you to think about that for a minute. So the victims, primarily girls, right, primarily females, call it the life. They're caught in the life. Traffickers, mostly men, call it the game. It's all a game. So let's talk about trauma reactions. Yes. So Don't read them. Does a trafficked individual get to choose a pill? Is that what that means? Um, How do they do that? Possibly. Depends. Sometimes it's not a voluntary choice. Sometimes they are chosen and they don't have a choice, and sometimes they are given the appearance as if they're given a choice, because this is their life. No, no, it doesn't to me, but there is an appearance of them choosing somebody else. Trauma reactions, young children. Now, we're going to have the normal trauma reactions that I'm not going to cover because you guys have been here for a day and a half and you've heard trauma up to here. But we see a few other things when we're looking at um, the trauma that we see in human trafficking. Uncertainty, whether danger still exists. Generalized fear, helplessness, easily alarmed, sleep disturbance. Loss of previously developed speech skills. Toilet skills regression. Engagement in traumatic play. Now, if you see one of these, am I telling you to call me and tell me you have somebody who's being human trafficked? No. I'm just trying to give you some of what's going on so you know. School age. They could have any of the trauma reactions that the zero to five could have, plus avoidance of previously enjoyable behaviors, rapid behavior changes from withdrawn to unusually aggressive, constantly repeat the story of the traumatic event, psychosomatic complaints, thoughts of revenge, sexual reactivity. Any of these a surprise? No. Adolescents can have any of the two prior slides. They also could be self-conscious about any emotional responses. They'll tell you they're going crazy. The fear of being labeled abnormal, fantasies of revenge and retribution, self-destructive behaviors, 
um, and we'll see sexual and substance abuse. The trauma affects their self-regulation and self-esteem. Children regulate emotional responses and develop self-esteem by mirroring the behavior and reactions from their caregivers. What they're shown is what they're going to develop. So when they have secure attachments with caregivers, they develop the ability to respond to stress based upon their models. This is where you get that flight or fight syndrome, right? This is where you develop that. So if you unsecure attachments, causes an inability to rely on their caregivers because they're being provided inappropriate, inconsistent, or ineffective responses to stress, and these children fail to learn self-regulation. This means when traumatized children become further overwhelmed, they cannot manage their own emotions. And they become further overwhelmed by the fact that they cannot manage their emotions, so it's a vicious cycle. Then children look to their abusers for comfort. <coughs> School-aged children tend to either become hypersensitive to emotions or ignore their emotions, which causes further guilt and shame. Adolescents develop more mature responses, but they base self-esteem on these same unsafe relationships. They engage in extremely reckless or extremely avoidant behavior. Consequences, trauma. Your natural alarm system does not work properly. That fight or flight, not going to work. Overreact to minor misunderstandings. They have trouble calming themselves down. They can be impulsive, numb to the situation. They have problems with boundaries. They become guarded. They have disruptions in their memory. What does disruptions in their memory mean for you with your child, the child on your caseload? They're not good reporters, right? You ask them a question, what happened to you? Let's, let's assume it's a basic question that they could answer. And they can't tell you. It's not that they don't want to tell you. They might not be able to, t might not be able to remember what it was. They have disruptions in memory. So what can trigger? Anything. Sounds, a car horn. A car horn that was sounding during the traumatic event can be a trigger. Familiar voice, certain words. Sights, familiar person, a certain place, particular color. And a familiar person or familiar voice doesn't mean it has to be a positive person or voice, just familiar. They know that voice. Smells, like a perfume. A certain food. If they're only given bologna while they're in captivity or being held, however the captivity looks, what's going to happen when you come to save them and you offer them a bologna sandwich? Nothing good. Do you have a question? It's all the above. It's all the above. We see human trafficking, um, plenty of stories where the children live at home and are trafficked during the day. They're going to school normal. They're not late for school. The trafficker picks them up. They're trafficked during the day. They're back at school to get back on the bus and back to the house. Correct. Correct. That could be community children, that could be foster children. They don't have to be kept in captivity. It looks like anything. It looks like anything. And that's why when I talk about runaways, we have to be conscientious of, it's not only your runaway children you have to be wary of. Children in home with parents that you suspect are trafficking their children have to be watched just as closely for these signs. Other trauma reminders or triggers. Touch, bodily sensations, body postures, someone startling, startling us, textures, feelings such as sadness, fear, lonely, shame, that can be a trigger. So we have some victim challenges. Lack of prosecution can be attributed to victims being considered a bad witness. If they're on drugs, what's going to happen? They're going to be considered a junkie. They are not considered reliable. Those disruptions in memory, that's going to make them a bad witness from the p position of prosecution. Pimps move to smaller cities and rural areas because they think law enforcement is not used to dealing with human trafficking issues, and there may be some, um, there may be some truth to that. In a county setting, anything other than a white girl are a novelty and can be worth up to $1,500. In labor trafficking, we see a tool rental fee. I just thought this was an interesting tidbit for you guys. Victims work or try to work 
they get a job, they don't have the tools. This is labor trafficking. They're trying to get a job. They don't have the tools they need for the construction site. The owner offers to rent them tools for an exorbitant fee. Victim can't leave because the owner threatens to report it as theft of the tools or the victim's illegal. Who are they calling in that case? Nobody, they're paying the fee. We have essential service delivery um, for children and youth. There's three things we have to consider. Cultural competency, youth development, and safety. Cultural competency. Staff have to have, and this is you guys. When I say staff, I mean it means at your program, your agency. They have to have a thorough understanding of the impact and dynamics and subcultures of CSEC. Okay, it's very similar to domestic violence. You're all thinking, because I think it, I've been doing this for a few years now, I think it, why don't they just leave? That's that subculture. It's the same thing as domestic violence victims. And how many times have you heard from somebody, usually not somebody in your agency, but somebody, I live with the lay person. He's not here, right? I call him the lay person. Anytime I need to talk, well, the lay person says, the lay person saw on the news, okay? He is the lay person. He doesn't do this. He probably couldn't tell you what I do for a living, okay? been doing this about 10 years. He couldn't tell you what I do. Um, do they understand the subcultures of CSEC? Do they understand why victims don't run? Do they understand when law enforcement pulls them over, why they don't say to law enforcement, I'm a human trafficking victim. He won't let me leave when he, she's in the car with the pimp. Do we understand that? We have to build on cultural strengths of the youth and incorporate that into the programming. We should employ staff that speak the language of clients and maintain a staff population representative of clients considering gender, race, ethnicity, and sexual orientation. And we have to work with victims as a whole person, not just the victim of abuse. Youth development. Believe all sexually, ex sexually exploited youth have the ability to be leaders. Infuse programming with youth leadership opportunities. Give youth ownership of aspects of program planning. Provide age-appropriate, engaging, youth-friendly activities. Provide services to meet short and long-term needs. What's their short-term need? To be safe. What's their long-term needs? We need to make sure they're not going back to the life. So what do we need to do to get them there? Address areas of adolescent development, all um, consider physical, cognitive, and psychosocial. Offer opportunities for youth to learn and master new skills. They have to have jobs. Because if they don't have jobs, what are they going to do? They're going to go back to the life. Whether they have a trafficker or they pimp themselves out, traffic themselves, they're going to go back to the life. Focus on youth building healthy self-esteem. Probably the hardest thing on that list. Foster a sense of belonging and importance in the community. Don't forget physical safety. They have to have a safe location with a security system, a confidential address, which provides different limitations, but you have to develop protocols for that. Set rules for appropriate conduct for youth. Create a staff code of conduct and ethics to and ensure training on that. Create an inviting youth-friendly space. Provide space for confidential interviews and counseling. Provide the space, but it's going to be about the choice. Based on your experience, and given the, the contours of the Safe Harbor Act, how successful, in, in your opinion and experience, has the, um, the safe house concept been since the act was signed? Um, I've only seen it in the Treasure Coast. Um, I think it's hard because you have to get the child to buy in. And what you're dealing with is a child who doesn't want to be separated. I have a child um, in Martin County, because I'm Martin County, um, who's a, in a sibling group of six. And she was trafficked by her mother. She was offered the opportunity to go to a safe house. We didn't think she would, because she would then be separated from her five siblings, three of which were in the placement with her. We actually had two separate placements for the six siblings. But she did. But that's what we had to talk about, how we were going to get her visitation and how we were going to manage that when she was about an hour and a half to two hours away from the rest of her siblings. But that was, you know, right or wrong, that's who she went through life with. It appears she was the only one trafficked, but that's her support system. And that's what we're dealing with. So I think you have to really work with those children to, to know that that's a safe place and everything can be dealt with, like visitation, because that was her number one thing. How am I going to see my, my siblings? 
because that's a big deal. I mean, we want their buy-in, but you're dealing with low self-esteem, and we're going to separate you, and then now you've separated the victim. What's the victim going to think? It's their fault, right? Now, we're all saying we know it's not their fault, but that's what the victim mentality is going to be. Um, she's in jail right now. She signed a surrender, but she's in jail. Emotional safety, appropriate music, Fetty Wap, not the music that should be playing in your office when that child comes to visit, right? That was the point. You knew I'd tie it in later, right? That was the point. Do not play music that promotes sexual exploitation. Decorate with appropriate informational inspiring images. Do not put any, um, maybe no thongs on the light lampshade in your office. Just my professional opinion. Use appropriate language. Be sensitive to derogatory terms. And remember, you need to know what those terms are. You need to know what those terms are. Create policies that address recruitment within the agency. Respect the child's need for privacy and confidentiality, but you have to offer them a choice. This is possibly somebody who was not allowed to leave where they were. So door open or closed during counseling. You don't want to lock them in there. Encourage self-soothing and self-care. Promote an inclusive and non-judgmental atmosphere. Ongoing professional development opportunities to ensure trained and sensitive staff. So what do you need to do? Number one is recognize social media signs that we could have a trafficked child. Be a mentor or, or maybe just being groomed. Maybe not trafficked, but maybe being groomed. Be a mentor or coach. FIRE is the um, acronym. We need to compare pimp versus boyfriend. Flattery. Isolation, request for secrecy, enticements look very different in a boyfriend versus a pimp, right? Hopefully. Hopefully. But they're using this. They're using flattery. By they, I mean pimp. They're using isolation. They're using a request for secrecy. They're using enticements. So in your work with those children, you have to address every one of those in a positive way and point out the difference between a pimp and a boyfriend without being judgmental. Easy task, right? You have the marching papers, go. Have to use the same language the trafficker is using. That's why you have to know. They're saying, do you know your worth? They're probably telling them they're worthless though, except for money. You're gonna say, do you know your worth? And you're gonna put a positive spin on it. You're not gonna make it about how they look. You're gonna make it about all those other positive things about your children, how they're caring, how they care for their siblings, how they, um, I mean, anything, but make it about them as a person, not their looks, because that's the only thing of worth to a trafficker. Do you know how beautiful you are? That's not about their looks. Make it about what a beautiful person they are, but you have to use the same language and give it more meaning. You have to take their phrases, and by they I mean the traffickers, use the same phrases and have it mean something different. You have to reprogram these children. Text at peak times, first thing in the AM, right after school or work, right before bed, because that's when the trafficker is. That's when the trafficker is texting. So you want to traffic at those same times. Remember, I thought you were beautiful today. Remember, I think you're a beautiful person, right in the morning. So we're going to do some case studies. We see a lot of crossover with other crimes. Rarely do we see human trafficking charges without a secondary charge or crime. I will tell you, we see a lot of the secondary crimes knowing it's human trafficking without seeing the human trafficking charge because attorneys in the area or in the room, why do we not see so much the human trafficking charge? It's harder to prove, way harder to prove. So if we can do 10 or 30 or 60 counts of sexual abuse or sexual assault or child porn, are we gonna do that? We are. Yes. They do that. They also give them a cell phone. Yeah, they just give them a cell phone. They give them a cell phone. And it's, and by the way, it's an iPhone. It's a really expensive phone. It's not some flip phone or anything. I mean, we're talking, they've done their time on their back. They will tell you, I did my time on my back for this phone.
Okay, so the victims are not supposed to be charged. They're not supposed to be charged with prostitution. They're not supposed to be charged with theft. There's even a statute, and I don't know the name number off the top of my head, where they can actually get those off their record if they've already been convicted. It's nonviolent crimes, though. It's nonviolent crimes, including prostitution. Now, if they are the victim that became a recruiter, that's a problem. They're probably going to be charged. They're going to probably be charged. Unless they can prove like coercion, um, I think there's some areas considering that across the country. There's some areas considering that was their way out. But they then trafficked somebody else or brought in somebody else, and that's not OK. So there is no law for that right now, but I think it's being dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. So I have some federal uh, reports, and by federal I mean ICE was usually involved, or Homeland Security. Atlanta sex trafficker sentenced to 21 years. This was just in April 2019. Quintavious Obi was indicted for sex trafficking in 2018, but continued to harass and intimidate victims and was charged with witness tampering as well. Obi lured young women from rural areas in South Carolina to Atlanta with a promise of a lucrative lifestyle. However, once they arrived in Atlanta, they were forced into a life of prostitution through mental and physical abuse. The victims were forced to engage in prostitution and to turn over to Obi all the money they received. His victims were not allowed to go anywhere without his knowledge nor see anyone unless they were paying client. Any deviation from the rules brought serious punishment. Obi was he was indicted, not indicated. He was indicted in January 2018, and then from January 2018 to April 2018, he had others call and text his victims to have them retract their statements to law enforcement in an effort to have his case dismissed. So he was also charged with witness tampering. I left in his AKAs because I thought you guys would get a kick out of Shank. Those are my favorite AKAs. When I worked in Miami, there was a guy whose nut name was 305. He's harder to find than you think. Right now we have a guy in Martin, his name is Boogie. That's what law enforcement told me. He was sentenced to 21 years, six months in prison to be followed by 10 years supervised release after pleading guilty in January 2019. These slides are in the PowerPoint that I had them upload, so I gave you the um, sites. You can read the full article. Large gang sweep leads to breaking down of human trafficking ring in Fresno, huge huge money maker for gangs huge number two right now possibly number two tied with um, drug running no guns drugs is number one guns and human trafficking is number two they kind of switch back and forth um, human trafficking is getting close to being number one do you know why gonna throw a little bit of ht101 in there do you know why nope Reusable product. God, I should, somebody write that down for me because I love that. Yeah. You sell the drugs, you sell the guns once. How many times do you sell them the girls? Hate to tell you, eight to ten times a night. They have a quota. Yes, ma'am. So, what happens to the people that are getting services from the ladies and boys? What are the, what's the you mean the Johns? Yeah, I mean, what is the, what is the, I didn't even plant her in the audience, but that is like a fabulous question. So, this is the thing. This is the thing. If you have 50 traffickers and 200 victims, would you be surprised to know you could be looking at 10,000 Johns? Who's law enforcement looking at? The traffickers. Who are you guys looking at? Service providers? The victims. So who's focusing on the Johns? Nobody as of late, nobody. Um, Seattle has a big push. Um, I saw them a couple years ago. They started a couple years ago. Amazing stuff there. They, contact, they got a grant from Google. They had a chat bot. And when the chat bot will get into it with a John, and you guys know what a chat bot is, right? It's like an automatic response. So they're chatting, and they think they're chatting with an underage girl, and it's really a chat bot. And when they, said, when they got down low enough and said the magic words, the chat bot responded, are you aware this is an illegal enterprise and you could be caught right now and brought to prosecution? And it was like, this is amazing. And they developed the equivalent of a batter's intervention class for the Johns there. 75% were self-referrals. When I saw them two years ago, they were saying 75% was self-referrals. Bout fell off my chair. 
right, for self-referrals. So Florida, since we're in Florida, there is a, um, and I don't know where we are in the legislative session, I should know because Alan updates us for us, but I don't know if we're near the end. We're not near the end? No, no, no. Done. They're done, so I don't know what happened. Toby Overdorf, Representative Toby Overdorf for Florida, and I think the senator that proposed the similar bill, I think was Gail Harrell. It was a mandatory minimum for the Johns when they're prosecuted for human trafficking. It was a 30 day, I met with Representative Overdorf because I had some questions, like why only 30 days? I, I kind of want longer. Um, the rationale was he thought it would fly at 30 days. It was originally 10, it was up to 30. And for the Johns, they have normal lives and 30 days in jail means more to them than it would to a trafficker. So they just wanted something to make it significant. Um, it was gonna run consecutive, not concurrent with the other charges. The problem I foresaw came back to the prosecution. If you're charging them with human trafficking and you're charging them with rape, rape's gonna be pled out a lot sooner than the human trafficking. Um, we didn't have a good solution for that, but he was working on it. I don't know what happened at the end of the legis legislative session, but they were working that on in Florida for the Johns. So, that's the part of where I live. There are, there are girls who are not, not young girls, but, but young women who are trafficked. Um, and they are very You're in Palm Beach? Yes. Palm Beach has a very active coalition, uh, very active coalition with their own task force. I would go to the coalition meeting, which is attended by every law enforcement agency in Palm Beach County, and I'd ask them. We'll talk afterwards. Okay. So Fresno Police Department arrested nearly 30 members of the Dog Pound Gang. It's the largest and most impactful gang sweep in the history of the city, coined Operation Dog Track. The gang financed almost all of its violent operations through money from sex trafficking. The top leaders of the Dog Pound Gang would each pimp out up to eight women at a time, and the gang generated about $30,000 a week through the trafficking. None of the women were arrested in this operation because they're the victims. The FBI said as part of the operation, they seized nearly $50,000 in cash, 17 luxury cars, one handgun, and luxury goods worth thousands of dollars. These were the individuals who were out recruiting young girls and using them as prostitutes, not only in California, but in five different states all the way to the East Coast, including Washington, D.C. Operation Dog Track. The dog track was from California to D.C. It was the track they were going, hitting all of those states in between. Those arrested face federal charges of conspiracy to commit murder and prostitution. Three employees of a local motel accused of knowingly providing rooms for the gang's prostitutes also went down on pimping charges. The next month, get the problems, I don't know where I'm at. Large investigation into the Kawa gang nets, dozens of arrests and gun seizures. In October 2016, Fresno again, Fresno County Sheriff announced the results of an ongoing investigation primarily focused on one criminal street gang on murder, robbery, drug dealing, human trafficking, and illegal gun trafficking. The Fresno Sheriff's Office um, worked with the MAGIC team. It's out there, the Multi-Agency Gang Enforcement Consortium in California, received assistance from several state and federal law enforcement agencies. They searched they served search warrants at 34 homes, arrested 47 people, and recovered 30 guns. So federal law enforcement for this used electronic investigative techniques. The Cowell Gang is a subset of the Fresno Bulldogs. The Bulldog Gang and their subsets are well established in the Fresno area since the early 80s. And regardless of all the enforcement efforts, lots of youth feed into these gangs as an accepted culture by the local com community. If you visit Fresno on a summer evening, they refer to the gang activity as a red wave, as this is the color of their shirts, and they wear the local Fresno Bulldog College t-shirts as their own. Way to be able to tell who's who, right? 
The entire investigation was kickstarted by a carjacking and rape case in December of 2015. The victim was robbed and sexually assaulted by two gang members. One was 17, who was tried as an adult and is serving a seven-year prison sentence. So the other arrests from this investigation, a shooting classified as an attempted homicide took place in the city of Fresno. 23-year-old uh, Juan Carrillo and a 17-year-old male were charged. Also, two suspects involved in human trafficking, pimping, and pandering, with a 25-year-old and 22-year-old have been running in an, an elaborate prostitution ring that stretched from Southern California up to the state of Washington. These two would force girls, some of whom were minors, to perform sex acts. If the victims did not obey orders, the suspects would beat them. Two 18-year-olds were charged with robbing a man by ripping a gold chain off his neck after beating him up. At the time, he was holding his two-year-old grandson. The child fell to the ground and suffered injuries to his head and face. Several of them were charged with smuggling drugs when they were um, booked into jail. Five people were arrested for possession of a firearm in public, one of which was a criminology student at Fresno State. The defendant who exploited opioid addictions of young women was convicted in March 2019. A three-day trial in federal court in New Hampshire found Stephen Tucker guilty of one count of sex trafficking of a minor and of using interstate facilities to promote a prostitution business enterprise and maintaining a drug-involved drug premise. So between October 2013 and June 2014, he operated drug and prostitution businesses in the Manchester area. He sold heroin to numerous individuals, including young women and a minor. Witnesses described how the defendant used their addictions against them, forced them to prostitute for his profit. The defendant would often front the heroin to the women and then arrange the dates for them. The women were required to give the defendant half of the proceeds and then purchase the heroin that he had them addicted to with the other half. On other occasions, the defendant withheld the heroin from women, causing them to suffer withdrawal symptoms, instructed them to prostitute to earn money to purchase the heroin that they needed they were going through withdrawal from him. The defendant's scheme guaranteed he had a steady source of drug customers and money. Some of the women were required to help the defendant sell his heroin and received heroin in exchange. The defendant used violence and threats to main control of the women. This demonstrates the power of opioids to support criminal activity. Brevard, thought we'd get to Florida. March 2019, Brevard man sentenced to 80 years for committing sex crimes against children. United States District sentenced, um, United States District Court sentenced Kenny M. Fitzroy, Isaac, 45 of Coco, to 80 years, 80 years in federal prison for production and possession of child porn. The court also ordered Isaac to forfeit the smartphones he used to commit the offenses. Thank goodness. Isaac sexually abused a homeless 13-year-old child on at least two occasions and recorded the abuse using his smartphone. Isaac met the victim at a gas station where she was panhandling with her mother. During the next two months, he then gained the family's trust by providing basic necessities for the family, including food, clothing, and shelter. He obtained 213 images of child porn from the internet, some of which depicted the sexual abuse and exploitation of infants, toddlers, and prepubescent children. So remember we asked, we, remember I asked about runaways, potential runaways, okay? Within 24 to 48 hours, two out of three runaways are approached by a human trafficker. Lake Worth, we're still in Florida. Residents sentenced to life in prison for sex trafficking and obstruction. This just happened May 1st, 2019. Austin Orlando Leroy Williams of Lake Worth was sentenced by a US District Court to five life sentences and an additional 20 years in prison, just in case that's not enough, to be followed by a lifetime of supervised release. In December 2018, Williams was convicted by a federal trial jury of two counts of sex trafficking a minor, three counts of sex trafficking by force, fraud, or coercion, and one count of obstructing a human trafficking investigation. From 2008 to 2017, Williams trafficked multiple women, including two juveniles, for commercial sex throughout Florida. Williams had the women live at his homes and travel to hotels and other locations to meet adult men and engage in sexual acts for money. Williams used force violence and coercion to traffic the women and kept all the money earned by the victims. He was arrested in November 2017 on related state charges before being charged and convicted federally. 
Port St. Lucie, my hometown. Port St. Lucie man sentenced to life in prison for producing and distributing child porn. This was in December 2017. It's an older one, but I kept it in there because it's my hometown. Wanted you all to know I'm not exempt. Port St. Lucie resident was sentenced to life in prison for producing and distributing child porn, coercing minors to produce child porn, and possessing child pornography. Want to make sure you get his name, Scott Joseph Trader of Port St. Lucie, previously pled guilty to enticement of a minor to engage in sexual activity, distribution of material containing visual depictions of sexual exploitation of minors, possession of matter containing visual depictions of sexual exploitation of matters, and production of material containing visual depictions of sexual exploitation of minors. November 2014 through May 2017, he video recorded himself sexually abusing two minor girls entrusted to his care, one of whom was two years old. Trader coerced dozens of minor victims online to send him child porn using social media applications and collected vast amounts of child porn from the internet, including the sexual abuse of infants and toddlers, sadism and masochism and bestiality. Trader distributed large amounts of child porn over the internet to adults and to minor victims as young as eight years old, which included videos and images of his own sexual abuse of children. And if you haven't lost your lunch yet, how do you engage with a child who doesn't want to engage? Remember, we're going to go back to those tough questions. So I've given you the case studies. We've talked about the trauma. And you're thinking of that child who just went through any one of those stories and who's now back, right? How are you going to engage with a child who doesn't want to engage? Any ideas? Excellent. If I had candy, I would throw it at you. Just you know, I flunked PE. It's not a good thing if I'm flunking candy. Stay where they are. These are some suggestions. Set goals they are interested in. Have faith the engagement will come. You can't force engagement. So the first question out of your mouth can't be, why'd you do that? You have to form that bond. And if you had the bond before, you have to reform that bond now where they are. You have to be where they are now, because now they've gone through something. It's not the same child you spoke to a couple months ago. Let them know from your own experience, if you have any or if it's appropriate, what you went through. At some point, you were a teenager, and you know you didn't want to hear anything, right? I mean, I'll tell you. OK, teenage years, not friendly for me. I talked back to everything, and I'm wondering why my child is developing the same tendencies. Anybody else? Right? If your parents said, don't date him or her, what would you do? Totally date them, right? Totally. Most of these children try to push people away, but if you continue to show up, trust will be built and they will not have succeeded in staying alone, right? Because that's a test. You guys do that, right? That's a test to see if you stick around when they can be as ornery as they can imagine. There's some other words, but I'm trying to keep it a little bit less R-rated. Use a transformational relationship model, which requires relentless outreach, motivational interviewing to engage youth who are hardest to reach and engage. How do you get CSEC victims to understand exploitation when they don't think they're being exploited? So you get that child back who was raped over and over for money but didn't see any of the money, and they don't think they were being exploited. How do you reach them? How do you explain to them exploitation? Any ideas? Well, lucky for you, I have some. Trust of the relationship. Are you seeing? Are you seeing a pattern yet? You're ahead of the game, John. When there's trust, you can say things they might not want to hear, but you can't say that before you have the trust. If they know you're not out to hurt them, they might recognize that what you're saying might, in fact, be in their best interest. Open-ended questions, which require you to think about different aspects of the relationship talk about safety plans, talk about future goals. This requires you to examine their situation and analyze whether they are in a safe and healthy relationship. And you know what they don't want to admit to themselves? That they're possibly not in a safe and healthy relationship. That's a big one for them. So it's not going to be forthcoming quickly. Use circles, like literally group circles, to open up a safe space to confront the hard issues, accountability, values in the context of peers, perspectives, feelings, and lifestyles. Try emotional literacy curriculum that's also used with trauma victims. Um, Non-judgmental. Non-judgmental. Now, another victim in the circle can be judgmental. Can't be you. Can't be the adult. 
How do you deal with a child who you've been working with long term, who's making positive progress, you're all excited, they have goals now, they're planning to go to college, they understand the dynamics of exploitation, and then they go back to the life. How are you gonna do, what are you gonna do? Who said it? John said it? You said it? Excellent. It's really all you can do, except for get a new clicker. <laughs> Be where the client is at. Don't get angry and don't blame. You're just there to talk when they're ready. Relapse is a part of addiction. How about that? Never thought you'd hear it in this context, did you? I was trying to be advanced for you guys. I know you saw that on the list. I had to be advanced. So I was like, that is awesome. Relapse is a part of addiction. How many times have you said it to a substance abuse victim? Somebody with substance abuse problems, a parent, your guardian, if you're talking to your guardian about the mom, why she can't break her habit. And how many times have we had a shelter? Two, three, four times because a parent relapsed. Right, yeah, Gretchen, you should raise your hand. I've been on it with you. Keep showing love. Remind yourself that things like this happen because it's an abusive relationship. Real quick, um, so the difference with the parents, though, so you're talking about relapse is part of addiction. We take parents' kids away from the relapse. Yeah, class. right. So we're teaching them that we are punishing you for relapse, and then when we have kids that are so tightly interwoven into a, to a relationship, or for example, we're trying to teach our parents. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to tell the kids is that it's okay I mean, it's not right, but it's okay, we'll work with you, but at the same time, we're telling, we're showing them that their parents, it's not okay, you messed up, and this is the final straw, this is it, and we're done with you. So how do you kind of, and I know not all of our kids are... Are you an attorney? Okay, because me too, so I don't know the answer to your question. Um, <laughs> I just think it's important for us to understand it's going to happen. Relapse is a part of addiction. I don't have a good answer for that one, because that's a really good juxtaposition. Look at that, juxtaposition. I should call my English teacher from 10th grade and told her I finally used it in a sentence and it made sense. But that's a really great example. But at some point, maybe the connection is, what does that relapse mean? It's not just the relapse, right? It's the fact that they couldn't take care of their child because of the relapse. You have to differentiate that if that comes up. This is for you guys to understand. This is an addiction. Going back to that person is the same as an addiction. That's why they go back. That's familiar. As horrible and, and all those stories, how horrible it is, it's an addiction. It's an addiction to like knowing that's your comfort zone because it's what you know. How many children want to go home? I do this when I do with this when I do guardian trainings. How many children want to go home? Okay, we're not allowed to say all of them. We have to say 99.99% because my circuit director tells me I can't say 100%, so stop saying all of them. They do, they want to go home, right? Because home is this fabulous place? Or is home where you come from, and where you come from, you don't want to leave? That's on our website, by the way. That's what it is. So that's a place, it's a concept, it's a safe place. It's a safe place, and you just have to understand, this could happen, it's gonna happen, just like somebody's going back to get drugs. You were next. Right. And I think this is, it's, it's, it's your internal process. For, I want you to understand it's a part of the addiction. And I don't TPR on the first relapse because relapse is a part of addiction. It's, parents are taught that. I'm saying for you, if you think about it in that mentality, maybe you can work with children in a better way, understanding it's nothing personal. If they go back to the life, it is nothing personal for you. It doesn't mean you weren't there. It doesn't mean you didn't have the right answers. It doesn't have to mean any of that. It could be simply they were lonely one night and that person answered the phone because that person wants to answer the phone because they want him back. It could be as simple as that. Is it not like brainwashing people like domestic violence? Yes. Absolutely. Completely similar. Um, fear, lack of love, low self-esteem, and a belief that you can't function outside the relationship makes people go back. 
You have to continue being there and do not take it personally like you haven't done enough work. It's not your fault. It's almost like I read my own PowerPoint and knew that was next. How do you work with a girl who has a daddy and says she's in love with him? Daddy. And they don't mean their dad. We're not talking father. We're talking daddy. How do you deal with that? Acknowledge to yourself. I added that to yourself because I thought it was confusing. It is frustrating and you just want to make him disappear. I said it. It's okay. Most of the time, the men they're with are older. So ask them questions about what they do together, what they have in common. Get her to think about manipulation and control in the relationship. It's important not to invalidate her feelings. She'll shut down if you tell her he doesn't really love her. That's like the worst thing. Helping girls look at the good parts versus the bad parts of the relationships themselves, particularly by having them write it down, can be far more empowering and supportive than simply telling her she's being exploited. That's like telling a trafficking victim you've been trafficked and using that word. They don't get it. How do you deal with a child who's actively recruiting other youth from your agency? They're recruiting in your agency. What are you going to do? You have to build a sense of trust, which can lead to having those tough conversations and explanations why it is not OK to recruit, because you are going to have that conversation. Provide an atmosphere of intensive relationship building and values. Take appropriate precautions and measures, as well as employ restorative justice, which I looked up for you guys because I had no clue what that was. It's a meeting between the victim and the offender to attempt to get the offender to take responsibility for what they did. That's so not going to go over well, but that's a suggestion. So you have them discuss the youth recruiting. Girls should know ahead of time that we are concerned about the recovery process and recruiting affects all parties as well as compromises our ability to help them. We have to protect all children in our program. All children, whether they were recruiters, whether they're victims, whether they come back and recruit, we're supposed to protect all children in our, in our different programs, okay? They may be discharged from the program depending on the program or dynamics, and if that's an option, they need to know that. When recruiters and pimps know their location or agency, what should you do? You guys could get this one. What should you do? They show up at the door. What happens when they knock on the door? Ivory. Are you answering the door? No. No! Good. That was the big suggestion. Do not allow them in the building. Shield youth in the program from accessing them outside the building as much as you can. Notify law enforcement, notify staff to be vigilant and take any action appropriate to ensure the safety of the youth we serve. All of the youth we serve. That was the important part there. The end. Questions? It's about 85% um, females and 15% males, and that's adults and children. The bill that you uh, referenced earlier, yeah. about the 10, 30 days, it yeah. died It did. The hotel one died too, I heard. Um, they were trying to get liability for hotels that um, if the trafficking happens at the hotel, they wanted to hold the tel hotel liable. First of all, you have to do education. And then you, they were trying to hold them liable, and that died last year. They retried it this year. I heard it might have gotten kicked out, struck from that part. Um, the big hotels, and let's, let's be honest, this is Vegas, right? We can talk about anything. The big hotels, not that it's not happening there, but that's not who we're looking at. We're looking at those little motel in the suburban lodge in Martin County. That's who we're looking at. The big hotels, the money pockets, not, no specific ones in general. That's who didn't want the liability because they were afraid of getting sued. And they pulled the lobbyist. So I'm hoping that comes back around. Yes, ma'am? What are your thoughts on the uh, spas that have been in the paper? Um, are you from the Treasure Coast? Melbourne. Melbourne. Because that is Treasure Coast. Yeah, sorry. Um, it is Martin County. It is Indian River. That's ours. Um, we haven't had any in St. Lucie County. I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop because that would be unbelievable. Um, I don't know if you heard, but they threw out the video. They threw out the videos, though I did hear it's going to be appealed. And that's my opinion on it. Um, I'm a little confused how somebody signed a warrant allowing the videos if it was illegal, which is what the ruling basically was that they shouldn't have been allowed to video because um, well, one thing they said was it might have been misleading. They implied, 
implied, and I'm not sure how you apply in a warrant, but they implied there was minors being trafficked, which there were not. There were minor Johns, but there weren't minors being trafficked. And there was no, um, there was no way when they were videoing to differentiate non-trafficking massages versus trafficking massages. So people who were not there for that purpose were also being videoed. I have thoughts on the Fifth Amendment also and who it protects, but we're not in law school anymore. So let's start at the top. I promise not to go to anyone else. You're sitting next to the attorney, so I know she's consulting. She's whispering in your ear, isn't she? You're in cahoots. Got it. Labor trafficking, right? And if I go get a massage, if I go get my nails done, and I go to, in my head, I look up on Google, on Yelp, reference for place, like you just said, how do you know that that's, that you're using something? You don't? No, that's the end of my answer. I mean, you just don't. Um, in that particular case, um, and I don't know how many of you have read about it, and if you haven't, it's fine. I'm not trying to be judgmental. I just don't want to talk about it if every one of you has read it. What happened was the health inspector went in there for normal, routine health inspecting duties. I'm sure there's an appropriate phrase, and I just don't know what it is. And they saw suitcases, and they saw what looked like people living in there, and that didn't make sense, and they went to law enforcement. So, I mean, if you are there and you go to the bathroom and it looks like people are living there or sleeping there, you might want to call law enforcement. You know what my problem is with that whole situation? That was a three to six month bust where you thought people were being human trafficked. You left as law enforcement people in that situation to make your case, I guess. Allegedly, whatever I'm supposed to say liability-wise for the thing. Allegedly, you know, not being judgmental, but I have a few follow-up questions. So, uh, hold on, because she had three. I want to make sure I get through them all. Right, um, and I think it's definitely about how you present it, and you have to have that relationship. I mean, nothing's going there without that trust. And not a lot of our agencies, I mean, if I'm wrong, don't correct me, no, I'm kidding. Um, not a lot of our agencies are kicking out the girls for recruiting. We're working on breaking that cycle. It's, it's huge to break that cycle. Um, I don't think a lot of us are kicking them out. If they are recruiting, we're trying to work to get them to not recruit. Um, but it is advisable to, to present it some way, and I'm not, Sorry, I'm, as the attorney, not the person to ask how to present it in a non-judgmental, non-cross-examination way. Do not call me for that. That is not me. Maria can help you, maybe. Um, but you have, to, you have to let them know that's, that's a possibility if that is a possibility from the program. That was just advice. Like, you don't want to just kick them out and be like, you've been recruiting without giving them any warning that you know, we need to work on other methods because you may not be able to stay if you continue this. It's got to be some way. Do you have another question? You put them together. Okay, you had a question. Yes. It's a comment, if you will. So the biggest fish of all, Jeffrey, that I've seen is right in the investigation, <coughs> the federal level. It seems like the traffickers from right the other end of town right, get, get the punishments, but the ones that uh, have the privilege seems got the sweetheart deal and hundreds of child victims outside of justice. Do you have an update on that? 
I heard they were re-looking at the investigation, but I haven't heard anything. They're keeping it under wraps. They really are, because it's an open investigation now into the, into the original, the new char the original charges. I heard there was possibly new charges, because new victims came forward, and the miss, um, the miss, um, the way it was dealt with the first time. So it's at a higher level, so I haven't heard anything on that yet. In the back. Is there any way to say alleged or this has been this has been put forward, we received an abuse report, they haven't finished the investigation, of course the child wants to address that it didn't happen. We can we are you with Guardian? Yeah. Okay. So can we say it in a more of a generic we're not sure yet because the investigation isn't complete, kind of punting it, but Right. So. Are you the attorney? Yeah. Okay, so sometimes the attorney takes one for the team and doesn't blame the guardian. That's the best thing I have for you. <laughs> Creative language. And then you tell your guardian to go over there and say, I don't know where he got that information. That's, that helps too. And it works, funny enough. Yes, sir. Is there a simple way to handle immigrants versus homegrown trafficked victims? Well, there, there's a federal act that protects um, it's very widely underutilized, but there is a federal act that protects them, so they are not going to be deported back. Um, it's hard to convince people they're not going to be deported. They have to cooperate in the investigation, and that's the biggest thing, but there is a federal act that protects that. Do you have a way or a recommendation to build the trust as we talk to that versus someone that doesn't have that additional step of fear? You have to understand, um, I think the biggest thing to understand is it wasn't safe for them in their country. And they're assuming it's, to be honest, a third world country. Law enforcement over there is very corrupt. The medical profession over there is very corrupt. So when you say, I'd like you to talk to my friend, Mr. Police Officer, they're saying nothing. Because in their country, you can't talk, trust that police officer. So know that, because that's what you need to work on first. You have to work on that, because you have to take them where they are. Right? You have to take the victim where they are, and where they are is they're coming from a place where you could not trust law enforcement. And that's the other reason I mentioned you know, someone pulls over, and why are they not telling law enforcement, I'm being held against my will. Why are they not turning? They're scared, because they've also been threatened. Their family and friends over there have also been threatened through them. And their needs are being met. And their needs are being met. The, the answer to all of that is yes, all of the above. However, make sure the service provider you're using has had the training. You know, sometimes we have service providers, even in, in our tiny circuit, we have a service provider who focuses on this, um, sexual abuse and sexual trauma, and, and they've had that extra training for human trafficking victims. And because there is a lot of crossover there, and so that's who we would go to for something like that. Um, you have to make sure you're using that provider. It's not just every therapist. Yes. Yep. Um, I think sexual predator. I think sexual predator, actually. My time's up, but you're more than welcome to stay. And here I thought I wouldn't have enough to say, right? Yeah, three oh, three minutes. Do you have a question? Yeah. Yes. Um, thought so.
the victim of sex trafficking, but the parent blames the child. Mm -hmm. And even with the services that you give the parent, the parent still has that kind of, you know, you can tell when the parent has that kind of residual. Mm -hmm. I mean, my child's not going home. You can just, you can like. I'm making the argument. If they're, if they're completing the case plan and everything, you can still make the case like, hey, they're still holding this kind of. Right, because it's not about the case plan, it's about behavioral changes. And that is a huge one, whether it's human trafficking or not. I have one other one that's just literally she blames the child for everything wrong in her life and she's finished the case plan and the child doesn't want to have visitation because all she does is blame the child when they do have visitation. So she's gone through the case plan, but what has she learned? Nothing. So the child's not going home and we're kind of caught in limbo because I don't have enough to, probably don't have enough to terminate parental rights. But that child's not going home. That's like re -vic re -victimizing. Re -victimizing the victim. Um, and maybe they need some human trafficking sessions. Bring them here. We will educate them. I promise. Somebody else had their hand up? Yes. Yeah, you were mentioning that some of those Johns were underage. So aren't they victims? I don't know that they've... Ooh. Yeah. Um, they haven't treated them as victims. They're not treating them as victims. In our case, they're not treating them as victims. I could tell you that. So, okay? I mean, just, you know, in the... Thank you. Thank you.